hear me, guys? Can I go? Yes, yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thanks for having me, Maratani. Uh, Ismi Fadi Hamad. I'm a pulmonologist and intensivist. Uh, I'm currently, I moved five years ago from Cleveland Clinic uh, main campus. I'm in uh, Cleveland Clinic, you know, um, Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'll be just, you know, in the next maybe 30 minutes to 35 minutes discussing about uh, ARDS mainly. Um, so we'll move the slides. I, it can sometimes be a bit slow to move. So we'll talk about, you know, ARDS as a definition, pathophysiology management, and I'll focus more about the ventilation strategy and setting in ARDS because I think that's one of the most important aspects um, in ARDS. So technically speaking, when we talk about ARDS, we're usually used to the definition that it's an acute process, if there's diffuse and there's inflammation to the lung, that definitely will lead to the increased pulmonary vascular permeability and then we'll have a loss of irradiation of the tissue. The most important aspect when we talked about ARDS is the concept or the aspect that this is not secondary to a cardiogenic source or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And simply when we talk about it, we're talking about the hallmark of ARDS with hypoxia, there's bilateral changes on the x-ray, and then there's diffuse alveolar damage on the pathological aspect on biopsy if you progress at any point to do a biopsy or autopsy of the lung. So the, the new Berlin criteria came in 2011. This is where you know, the final definition came out. The timing is important because we always talk about an acute process. And this is usually within one week of an insult that happened to the body, either primarily in the lung or outside the lung. And Zayma Hakena, there is the radiographical changes that we see with bilateral infiltrate usually, and this is not explained again and again by any form of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So the most important aspect when we talk about it, when we talk about the PF ratio, this is what we normally do in somebody with a normal blood gas, with a room air amount of oxygenation, we measure their PF ratio and we expect a normal PF ratio in a normal person like me and you, if you don't have any primary lung disease, to be around the 500 range. We divide the PaO2 in millimeter mercury, which is normal, we should have between 80 to 100. And then we divide that by the amount of FiO2 you're inspiring or having in the absolute decimal rate. So media at a 0.21 will give us the PF ratio of 500. And why this is important, it's because when we talk about the severity of somebody with confirmed ARDS, we go between mild, moderate to severe based on the PF ratio. 200 to 300 is the mild, you know, moderate is 100 to 200 and definitely the severe form go to the PF ratio below 100. And again, this is simply done by measuring the blood gas PO2 and dividing that by the absolute number of FiO2. So if somebody PO2 is 100, 100% high flow oxygen, that's 100 divided by one, that's equal to 100. Is a, is a, if you're giving him 50% FiO2, that's 100 divided by 0.5, and the percentage is and then that's why you get the numbers between 100 uh, to 200 to 300. So as I, as I said, usually it's an acute process. There's the typical appearance with distress, shortness of breath, you know, tachypnea, diaphoretic, uh, depends on how severe the uh, ARDS phase it is. And then um, these are the usual presentation. Now history is very important in here. I know if he tells you that I have an EF ejection fraction of 10% and he's coming with pulmonary edema with in increasing edema in the lower extremities, then you can think of heart failure. But now you have a 50 years old with fever, shortness of breath, coughing, and then he's hypoxic, you think of pneumonia, ARDS. So taking a good history is very important in order to rule out other etiology of non-ARDS cause of pulmonary edema. And 99% we're talking in here either about heart failure, our COPD or chronic smoker who's coming with hypoxemic failure or an asthmatic. So taking good history with past medical history with a known cardiac disease or absence of cardiac disease is always uh, very important. If you simply do an x-ray, you will have a diffuse bilateral lung infiltrate, typical appearance in here. Now, without a good history, I cannot tell if this is a heart failure patient with an EF of 10% coming with pulmonary edema or an ARDS with you know, febrile illness, with pneumonia, with influenza or COVID or other cause of pancreatitis with severe ARDS. 
So again and again and again, the history is very important because part of the treatment is treating the underlying cause of the condition and part of the treatment is treating the ARDS by itself. And we'll talk about this in a minute. When you go to the extreme format, this is the extreme format when you go into the severe ARDS. This is when you have, this is one of our patients, you have an ECMO cannula in here. So you can see severe diffuse bilateral. This is the, you know, the typical kind of end stage um, advanced, let's say, ARDS with severe PF ratio. Usually we, you'd expect a PF ratio in the 60s or 50s with this format of patient. If you decide to do a CT scan on those patients, you can usually see bilateral lung infiltrate. You can see the ground glass opacities you have here in there, a consolidation because of initial pneumonia. You usually, you don't see pleural effusion, or if you see pleural effusion, it's very minimal. Tell you it's an acute inflammatory process. It's acute alveolar process. And then this is why you go into this form of pulmonary edema and alveolar process, not because of cardiogenic source. So what are the common causes of um, ARDS? The usual way we look at it, and, and simply when I'm running on anybody with ARDS, it's simple. Is it a primary disease affecting the lung or is it a systemic inflammatory process in which ARDS happens? So in the lung, it's simple. We always know the pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia are the most common causes. Very infrequently, you see an ARDS because of fungal pneumonia. You can see it with PCP. You can see it sometimes with CMV pneumonitis and immune compromised transplant patients. But in most of the conditions, it's usually a bacterial or a form of viral pneumonia, plus minus in all population and aspiration pneumonia. The second most common cause is the bacteremia and sepsis. You have a pyonephritis, you have a bacteremia secondary to a, a, an abscess, you have any form of you know, infection intra-abdominally that developed into bacteremia, sepsis, and septic shock, then ARDS can you know, happen. So the two most common causes of you know, ARDS is either a primary lung infection or bacterium and sepsis not in primary lung. And then this tells you that 80% of your, of your ARDS are due to an infection either in the lung or outside the lung. If you talk about other non-infectious conditions, there's a, the list is too big. You can go with trauma, you know, with pulmonary contusion, fractures with lung bone fracture, with fat embolism, air embolism, burns, massive transfusion. If somebody is coming with massive, you know, bleeding with hemorrhagic shock and he gets massive transfusion protocol, they're at risk of having, you know, transfusion related acute lung injury or, and then this will end up with ARDS picture, drug overdose, mainly opioid. Patients who goes, you know, into pulmonary bypass, you know, for cardiac surgeries or lung transplant that can sometimes go into post-perfusion injury. And definitely, you know, one of the other most common conditions you will see is the pancreatitis where the acute inflammatory process end with ARDS. And the, again and again, the reason why I'm emphasizing on that aspect, because the treatment includes the treatment of the primary condition, plus there's the treatment of the ARDS. So if I'm thinking of pneumonia and bacteremia, if I don't appropriately do source control, give antibiotics and for cultures, versus if it's just, you know, a trauma and I need to appropriately handle the fluid, you know, balance of the patients, it would matter. If it's sepsis and have not been treating the, uh, the real infection, then whatever treatment I'm doing is not gonna respond um, uh, based on, you know, a wrong treatment. That's why again and again, history is very important and, you know, the cause of ARDS is very important. So again, we mentioned that again, but it's just important to mention that it's an acute alveolar process. There is you know, always kind of endothelial damage leading to the increased per permeability in the lungs. And the workup is, that is almost always directed to the source of the potential cause of the ARDS. We all get the basic blood workup, CBC, chemistry for the kidney and the liver. If you're suspecting an infection, you do all the blood cultures, sputum culture, urine analysis um, and culture. If you're suspecting an abscess, then you need a CT abdomen and pelvis. Definitely blood cultures are needed in those situations. If you think of a viral illness like where we are right now, then a viral panel, now we talk about COVID swab. If you do a serial blood gases, definitely could give you initial hint of the PF ratio for that patient with that X-ray. I want to know how sick the patient is. If his saturation is 80%, versus 95% is a spear to 100 on two liter versus 150% high flow, all these matters. Imaging is also guided by the cause. So a simple chest X-ray is almost, all, almost always needed. A CT scan of the chest may not be needed in acute process, but it could be needed if you're suspecting a lung abscess or if, you, if you're suspecting an abdominal abscess, a CT abdomen and pelvis is needed. We almost always get an echo because you need to route any primary cardiac disease. Usually a bedside echo could be enough. 
you assess the left ventricular function easily, look for pericardial effusion, or somebody with a non-cardiac disease, they can still get septic and then have a worsening, you know, cardiogenic shock on top of the septic ARDS picture. So don't be fooled if you find an EF of 30% on somebody who has known to be 50% that this is not ARDS because if you have sepsis, cardiogenic pulmonary edema can develop secondary to, you know, a cardiac dysfunction, secondary to a, a sepsis process. And then, as I said, you know, the respiratory cultures, either you do a sputum, a vital panel, a deep BAL, if somebody's intubated, very rarely and almost never we do an open lung biopsies anymore. This is more of an autopsy. If you really try to know a cause of, you know, ARDS, we have seen very frequently somebody who's immune compromised ended with, a, you know, having, you know, uh, aspergillus in the lung that was not diagnosed or a PCP uh, pneumonia. But the basic workup is almost, you know, standard among um, those patients and it's tailored according to the course. If I'm suspecting pancreatitis, I'll add amylase lipase, for example. Um, as I said, the medical management is very important in here because we're talking about, you know, a, usually a progress into multi-organ failure with acute kidney injury, one of the bad markers that may happen. They rarely die from hypoxia. They usually die from the secondary complication with multi-organ failure. And as I said, you know, usually, you know, um, we have to look at, at, the, at the cause of, of, of the um, hypoxia. And this is why we need to manage hypoxia because in order, usually you need to improve their uh, arterial oxygen saturation. You give them more oxygen, you try to decrease their oxygen consumption, you improve their oxygen delivery methods, and then you advance them to mechanical ventilation in order to prevent that to refractory hypoxia. So you need to supply them with the oxygen in order to provide adequate tissue oxygenation in them. So let's go to more practical approach. So now we have somebody with ARDS, we have admitted him, we know we're looking for the etiology. We have done the workup. You know, you're suspecting either a pneumonia or a pancreatitis. You have done the workup. You're looking for the primary cause of the condition. You send the cultures. You send on broad, broad spectrum antibiotic. So let's go more to the practical approach. And the practical approach start, as I said initially, in hypoxic patients is to go with the oxygen delivery methods. And this is the standard process, you know, where we usually start from a nasal cannula. You go for a venturi mask simple face mask, non-rebreather, high flow, non-invasive and mechanical ventilation. And you can see the limit of amount of oxygenation. So I, I, I can tell you for sure, if I see anybody setting 90% on six liters, I usually would not go up to 10 or eight or 10 liters on the nasal cannula because usually the flow is impaired and the benefit is impaired beyond those six liters. That's why I go to a veni mask or a face mask an underbreather mask is almost always temporary, where I usually use it to bridge somebody to go to high flow. You don't need all the time to go from level one to level two to level three. You can go from nasal cannula to an underbreather. You can go from veni mask to high flow. You can go from simple face to intubation. But if you're gonna, you want to go in sequence, that's the process. But at the same time, make sure you're appropriately monitoring that patients, and you just do not need to intubate the patients. We have been severely hypoxic on six liters for five hours, setting 80%, and you have missed the window where he could have improved with high flow oxygen and buy him time to improve with oxygenation and treating the primary condition. So when it's bad, this is when we talk about the severe ARDS, right? So now you tried, you know, oxygenation and the patient is deteriorating. Usually this is where we go to the advanced phase where we do intubation and start the patient on mechanical ventilation. In this way, you have tried, you know, diuretics if somebody's volume overloaded, antibiotic, treating the sepsis, following the blood gases, following the PF ratio, trying high flow. Usually, you know, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, I use, if I use it in a severe ARDS, it's a very brief process. I would not keep somebody on six hours or eight hours or 10 hours on, on BiPAP if it's not improving. Usually it should be a transition, two, three hours, four hours. If you don't see significant improvement, if you see actually sometimes the wrong message that the tidal volumes on that bike non-invasive ventilation is going to 600, 700 tidal volume, it's a wrong message that the patient is actually likely having more damage with high tidal volume, more airway, you know, you know, um, um, distension and more, you know, ventilation induced lung injury. So don't be fooled that the patient is achieving good tidal volumes on non-invasive ventilation. Use the PF ratio, use the Cox index if you have that simply dividing you know, the respiratory rate by the FiO2. And then simply based on that, you can figure out your absolute need to go with mechanical ventilation. The advice in here is never delay intubation. 
why somebody was on high flow or BiPAP and not responding. Once you go into severe PF ratio with fail of response to the primary treatment and failing of oxygen with other methods, the only approach to go next with intubation and mechanical ventilation. And this is where your process of severe ARDS comes with a PF ratio usually below 100. This is when we go with the step that we intubate, we sedate, when we place a central line, an arterial line, and actually we put an NG feeding tube at the same time. In this process, you do three steps at one, you do one x-ray for the patient. So the usual process of the patient's already not, you know, um, having any central line, arterial line, we intubate the patient. At the same time, we put a central line, arterial line, we do an NG feeding, do a chest x-ray. Whenever you start the intubation and severe ARDS, you have to sedate the patients in order to have appropriate synchrony on mechanical ventilation. Propofol fentanyl is the standard process. You can use remifentanyl if you have it. Sometimes if it's young, you can use midazolams in the form of benzodiazepines, but appropriately early on, propofol and fentanyl are the standard approach in there. If you achieve you know, good you know, um, sedation with synchrony of the vent, you do not need to start them on neuromuscular blockade agents. Now, if with propofol fentanyl, is synchronizing with the vent, you're having good, good tidal volume, good admitted ventilation, good appropriate response with the PEEP, no need to add you know, a neuromuscular uh, agent. You need to paralyze them. If you're not achieving that, then you go to start either boluses or infusion. And we'll talk about that um, in a minute. At this moment, if we want to talk about one single intervention that could be very helpful in patients with severe ARDS who are intubated on mechanical ventilation is what we talk or what we call low tidal volume mechanical ventilations. We aim of a tidal volume to be 6 ml of ideal predicted body weight. This is based on the height of the patient and his sex. So please don't use the standard weight. It's very simple calculation online. You can do it. You have to target a 6 ml per ideal body weight. And this is one of the landmark only interventions so far, plus minus pronic that we can talk about in a minute that help in decrease mortality in ARDS. So if you see somebody mechanically ventilated, and he's getting a tidal volume with, 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 with uh, eight or nine or 10 you know, ml per kg, please make sure you bring that down to seven then to six in order to adequate a low tidal volume mechanical ventilation. So this is what we do standard, right? We try to maintain negative balance. So now he's intubated, sedated, paralyzed, tidal volume six ml per kg. We usually try to maintain a negative balance in absence of refractory, hemorrhagic shock or you know, severe renal failure uh, or severe septic shock, then diuretics are helpful in order to maintain a negative balance. At least you want them to be even to negative, usually with intermittent, intermittent boluses of furosemide. We need to maintain a map of 65 and above. That's why norepi usually started. If you're talking about septic shock, ARDS, that's why your center line is, imp is important. And as you can say, if you need norepi, propofol, fentanyl, antibiotic, you already need a central line in here. So this should not be running in a peripheral IV with no central axis. We almost always aim for a saturation to be in the 88 to 92%. You don't need those patients to be saturating 100%. So having a PF ratio in the, in the 60, 70 to start with, your PO2 is in the 60 to 70, that's more than enough. The next day you can see if they're improving, their PF ratio goes to 80 uh, to 100, the PO2 goes to 120. I bring down their FI2 from 100% to 90% to 80% gradually. This is a sign of improvement. You don't want them to be satting 100%. You don't want them to have a PAO2 in the blood gas to be 200 millimeter mercury. So use appropriate targets between 60 to 80 millimeter mercury in the blood, 88 to 92 uh, on, on the saturation uh, on those patients. And again and again and again, you have to treat the underlying case uh, cause, you know, um, in those patients. Something very important that I see a, a lot of, you know, practices in the Middle East, they put patients on TPN. You know, when you get intubated with severe ARDS, they put them on TPN. TPN should never be the target in feeding for those patients. An NG feed, tube feeding is the target. The same thing for glucose management, you know, have them between 140 to 180 is, what, is the adequate you want them to, to be there milli, uh, in, in uh, um, uh, milligram per deciliter of glucose. DVT prophylaxis, all of those patients should be on DVT prophylaxis. So three strategies, DVT prophylaxis, they should be standard on them. 
standard protocol, either use the inoxaparin or the heparin prophylactic doses, tube feeding by NG feeding, and then the third part is, you know, uh, glucose management in those patients. Do not use TPN um, as a standard treatment, uh, sorry, as a standard feeding process, unless you have an indication for that. Somebody post bariatric surgery, somebody who is not tolerating a cancer, you know, obstructing the stomach, it's a different story in there. So going back to the important aspect, and again and again, I'm focusing on those because these are very important to improve the survival in your patient with severe ARDS on mechanical ventilation. So modern ventilation is important. We'll talk about it. The tidal volume is important. We'll talk about it. What we talk about, ventilation synchrony, peak plateau pressure, and the lung compliance. All of these are important factors when we talk about managing a severe ARDS who is intubated in the ICU. One factor we always talk about in those patients is the plateau pressure. So when I intubate somebody with ARDS, we put them on mechanical ventilation. And then we decide, are we going to do a volume control, pressure control mode, PRVC, pressure regulated volume control. Please never put somebody on severe ARDS on SIMV mode. We see that a lot of time, SIMV, SIMV pressure control. You know, Technically, SIMV pressure control in a sedated patient equals pressure control, but the standard process is pressure control or volume control with the tidal volumes I mentioned about. Now, a target we look at is the plateau pressure in the lung. And, and this is very simply, when somebody is mechanically ventilated, you know, through the ventilator, you have a setup in which at the end of the inspiration, you do a hold. So you tell the ventilator now to stop the ventilation for the patients for a half a second to a second at the end of inspiration. And that tells me the pressure in the alveoli of the lungs. And this is very important because it's a marker of, you know, actually, you know, how much we're having, you know, pressure as a plateau pressure in the lung. And we really always want that to be below 30. And this is the point where we use the low tidal volume. When you give low tidal volume, you're trying to push less air in the lung and you're trying to maintain a plateau pressure below 30. So it's a low tidal mechanical ventilation, 6 ml per kg to achieve a pr plateau pressure below 30. These are all bedside intervention you can do. Somebody would tell me, I have put the patient initially at a 7 ml per kg, and I have a plateau pressure of 32. What's my next step? I bring him down to 6 ml per kg, targeting a pl plateau pressure below 30. Remember, the number sometimes could be inappropriate if you have somebody with severe abdominal distension, somebody post, you know, surgeries in the abdomen, um, somebody who is obese, but roughly speaking, you know, I don't, I don't know if we have the advanced, you know, you know, um, esophageal balloon, balloon measurements in there, but if you don't have that, just do an inspiratory hold, aim a target of less than 30 with bringing the tidal volume. And even sometimes we bring the tidal volume to 5 ml. The lowest is 4 per the studies. But usually you'll see by 6 ml, you should be able most of the time to target a plateau pressure below 30. The second thing when we talk about in those patients is the compliance of the lung. How much stiff is the lung? So intubate, sedate, paralyze. In severe ARDS, you will see that the movement of the lungs is difficult, right? You have a stiff lung. The more the lung is stiff, is the less is the compliance, right? Ideally speaking, the ventilator should all, almost always give you the, the dynamic compliance. It should be there. And again, a number is usually 50, 60, and more is a good number. In severe ARDS, usually you'll see their static compliance could be in a single digit or double digit. And then you can see the calculation here. It's very simple. You have the tidal volume that the patient is having on divided by plateau pressure minus P, P pressure, which is the driving pressure. Kulmat hasan tidal volume it will give me a better static compliance. كل ما احتجت يكون عندي less plateau minus peep معناته البسط أقل معناته عم بتحسن بالstatic compliance. So this is usually a good marker عم بشوف كيف مريدي بتحسن كل يوم أو لا. I'll see the plateau pressure, you know, getting less and less. The driving pressure is أقل. عم بشوف الstatic compliance كانت مبارح عشرة اليوم خمستاش بعد ثلاثين. These are all signs of improvement. At the same time, I see the oxygen requirements عم تنزل. LPEP requirements, I'm thinzel on those patients. So these are all kind of things that are correlated in the first 48 hours, which is important. Intubate, sedate, paralyze if not synchronizing with the vent, achieve a low tidal volume, plateau pressure below you know, 30, and look at your static compliance of the lung in order to see how things are going. 
هلا when you put a setup initially you put the FiO2 and usually in severe ARDS, ARDS will be with 100% right and then you play around with the PEEP. PEEP is one of the few things in ARDS that usually you start high in severe ARDS. You don't you should never have somebody with FiO2 100% in severe ARDS with a PEEP of 5. Unless you know and like a massive massive barotrauma you should not have a PEEP of 5 with an FiO2 of 100%. And this is all go with the PEEP, you know, um, 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 strategy. This is what I talked about initially, you know, as a landmark study, you know, that was based on that, we use a low tidal volume, a low plateau pressure below 30, using, you know, the strategy with um, of the Arsenal protocol study. And Ian, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that study, but this is the landmark study that showed low tidal volume, maintaining a plateau pressure below 30, give you increase, uh, sorry, decreased mortality in those patients. And this is what I talked with you guys about the strategy we, we use. and the multiple tables. We have two strategies when we talk about severe ARDS. The lower PEEP, higher FiO2, and the higher PEEP, lower FiO2. But remember, it's up to Tullah and other strategy, مستحيل تلاقي حدا على 1 or 100% FiO2 will PEEP عنده 5, 6, 8, 10. It's always going up. I don't say you need to go to 18 or 24, but I'm saying if you are at least on 50% FiO2, with ARDS picture, I would expect the PEEP to be at least 10. Again, if you go to the table at Tahti, you can see they use a higher PEEP strategy. This is various per center uh, on center, but again and again, I usually go with the first one, which is the lower PEEP with the higher FiO2. And then let's say I have somebody with severe ARDS. I just intubated him. Bahatu al 100% FiO2, Bahatu a PEEP of 10, Bahatu a respiratory rate in the around 25 you know, basically, I know I'm giving him low tidal volumes, I need to wash out the CO2. And then based on the next blood gas, I can decide. Usually, if the gas is improving, we keep the PEEP at the higher level, we will not sell FiO2, because the PEEP is important in ARDS picture. So when you see me, when somebody is improving with FiO2 or PEEP of 10, I go to FiO2 90, then 80, then 70, then 60, is that a blood gas I'm with Hassan, and the PEEP at 10. Till I reach usually an FI2 of 50%, I start bringing down the PEEP from 10 to 8, you know, to 6 for the winning process. Um, again and again, this is what I just talked about. I'm not going to talk about it, you know, one more time in here. But the point I want to bring in here is what we call permissive hypercapnia. When I tell the patients go low, get low tidal volume, I'm telling him to be hypercapnic. That's why we need to give them a higher respiratory rate. So you should never have a tidal volume of 6 ml of nafsil to cone a rate of 10. And your pH will be 7. So what you do, you give low tidal volume, you give high respiratory rate to compensate of what we call the permissive hypercapnia. So this is exactly, you know, where we um, do, we accept a pH usually of 7.25 to 7.3. So don't panic if your pH is high in the 50s, and you're maintaining a pH of 7.25 to 7.3 with low tidal volume and rate of 25, because this is exactly what we want to have in here. Low tidal volume, high rate, permissive hypercapnia. This is the mode of ventilation we talked about. Either you do volume control, pressure control. Really, there is no right or wrong. You know, I usually like you know, volume control because this is what study in the ARDS protocol. The advantage with pressure control sometimes if you start with high driving pressure, I can see more and more improvement with tidal volumes improving on the same setting of pressure control. So that's one of the advantages in there, but it does not matter which one you use in there, as long as you're maintaining a low tidal volume. We talked about the PEEP. I'm not gonna you know, um, repeat that aspect, but again and again, please don't have an FiO2 100% with PEEP of 5. This is a very common mistake we see frequently. And then you need to correlate the PEEP with that table I showed you. All what I showed you is in that ARDS study, you know, ARDS net study that was done like 20 years ago now. Um, prone position. I don't know if you guys pro use prone position um, in your current practice, but this is one of the very useful strategy. I would highly recommend is the ANCOMIL capability to use proning is to do that in your hospital. All you need is initially uh, a mannequin. You need, you know, training. In YouTube, I'll a lot of videos that's available in there. If you don't have anybody who's trained to do the proning, usually you need three to four people. 
but it's really one of the strategies that really help big time. Studies showed decreased mortality. And actually with COVID-19, with the patients we had, it was very significantly effective in improving oxygenation and decreasing you know, mortality in patients with either ARDS, COVID or non-COVID. So if you really have the capacity to do proning, I would highly recommend to do it. If you don't have, trust me, investing in that as one of kind of, you know, um, 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 a simulation training, that would be very rewarding for you as a team. And you will see the outcome. Once you prone somebody within four hours, you'll see the PF ratio went from 100 to 200 within like three hours. Again, not everybody responds, but the response is dramatic. And we usually what we do with the proning is once you sedate, paralyze, optimize, tidal volumes, PEEP, diuretics, if all of that, you're still maintaining a PF ratio below 150 after standard of care of what I just talked about, we usually prone them for like 12 to 16, 16 to 18 hours. And usually the studies has shown improved survival in those patients. We keep proning every 16 to 18 hours. We put them supine after that. And you know, if they maintain on supine for four hours, a PF ratio of more than 150, we stop proning. If once you put them supine, the PF ratio drop again to 100, we give them another four hours of break, then you prone them again till you achieve a PF ratio more than 150 with FI2 of 50 and PEEP of 10. Trust me, again, again, I, I know I'm Baid Nafs al Jumla, but if you really want to invest in something that can really help your ARDS patients is proning, and it's not much based on any, a lot of, you know, more than teamwork and training efforts, there is no usual equipment needed. We don't use the fancy beds, we don't use the fancy pillows. It's just very simple kind of training investment that we have done in our team that really achieved a, bit, a lot of outcome in those patients. So when we talk about rescue therapy, if proning is one of those, you know, um, um, that I just talked about, which is highly recommended. Um, inhaled nitric oxide or any inhaled, you know, pulmonary vasodilator, you know, like Flolan is also usually kind of recommended in the next, in the first 24 to 48 hours. Some studies showed in the nitric oxide increased risk of renal failure. They don't recommend it. The way I use nitric oxide, if you also have it uh, where you are, is just as a quick bridge in order to buy me time till I prone the patients or I treat them for the first um, uh, 24 hours. We usually go with 20 you know, uh, milli uh, million particles per minute, ppm. And then you know, we see in 24 hours, if I don't see much response, I stop it. If I see a response, it's by me time either to prone. Do I prone with NO? Yes, I can do proning with NO at the same time. It helps more and more. But if it's not effective in 24, 48 hours, I stop it. You know, uh, And usually it's just given um, in the initial first four to eight hours. So if it's like six days or seven days or 10 days, it could be a bit late and may not be effective. Definitely, you can see there's more modalities of mechanical ventilation, APRV, um, uh, H, you know, um, high frequency oscillator ventilation. We don't use them, you know, most and more data is showing not being effective and more of the low tidal volume, pressure control, volume control, although APRV is being used intermittently. Um, and then the final approach is definitely ECMO. Um, this is the end stage. We do ECMO where I practice in here. Um, it's your final process where you have reached all strategies. If you have the capacity to do it, it should be early, within seven days, with absence of multi-organ failure, absence of you know any kind of malignancy. There's a lot of you know kind of um, restriction to use ECMO, but we have used it. You know the studies as if, if you know it's used 50-50 per you know survival. The secret in, in ECMO is um, you should do it early on. It should be within the first seven days. You should have tried every conventional treatment first. If you have not proned the patient, you should not. ECMO. So you should do proning first. If you're not using low tidal volume, you should use low tidal volume. If you're not sedating, paralyzing, you should do it. So it's after optimization with fill treatment, with every aspect, then it should become uh, an option in there. Just last slide quickly, just to tell you what we talked about very importantly when we talk about the synchrony. This is exactly where, what you should avoid in here. You should avoid, you know, the vent, the synchrony, because this is what gives more damage more, you know, alveolar injury. And that's why when we usually, you can see the first one is double breathing. That's why if sedation is not working in here, we paralyze and you can see how the patients become more synchronous. You should avoid what's written as one and two because that gives you more damage. If this is achieved by sedation enough, that's perfect. If it's not, then you paralyze the patient 
And the same thing if you do also ineffective trigger. So all of these factors are important to avoid in severe ARDS. So double loop triggering, as I said, you know, paralyze them. The same thing with ineffective triggering, you can play a bit with the vent. But again, my message in here, if you use sedation for first, if not working, you go ahead and uh, you do the paralytics um, in there. Final slide, you know, weaning. This is exactly where we now reach a point that the patient is improving. How do I see that? I see the blood gas improving, the plateau pressure is improving, you know, the um, airway compliance is improving, static compliance is improving, the infection has resolved, the sepsis is resolving. So this is where we start weaning, and you can see here as part two weaning. Now my PEEP is below eight, the FI2 is in the 40s, you know, or you can use a 50 and five. The primary condition is improving, you know, you know the x-ray is getting better, he's no more hypotensive, you know, there's no, you know, uh, paralytic agents being used anymore. Then you can start your weaning, the SBT, that's going to be a separate lecture to be taking care of, you know, all that discussion. But again, you're trying to achieve a weaning process with the FI2, usually I do less than 50%, P less than five, primary condition has improved, stopping sedations, spontaneous breathing trials, spontaneous working trial, we stop sedation, look at the patients, and then readdress the needs uh, to extubate uh, uh, the patients. But all of the th most important thing that the primary condition should have resolved um, as a cause of um, his ARDS. So I'll stop in there. Um, I hope I was able to provide within those last 45 minutes a quick kind of um, approach to ARDS and mainly focus in severe ARDS and happy to answer any question. I just left the last five to 10 minutes to see if you guys have any questions. Now we, we had an argument about which uh, interventions are best uh, or, or have a mortality benefit on uh, ARDS. Uh, is, it, is it only low tidal volume uh, ventilation or are there any, any other interventions for that? So there's three aspects in there that were studied. One that's confirmed 100% is the low tidal volume mechanical ventilation. The second and third approach were proning. And the third approach was the use of neuromuscular blockade agents paralytics. So proning definitely had shows decreased mortality outcome in the patient. So that checked. In regards to the paralytic agent, there was a study that was published 10 years ago by Papazian from the French study in which they said, if you paralyze the patients within the first 48 hours, they would have better outcome with decreased mortality. A recent study that was published three years ago did not show that continuous infusion of paralytics is needed if you're achieving good sedation. So the answer to your question, low tidal volume in parallel with you know, plateau pressure below 30 and proning, the, 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 the aspect of um, uh, neuro uh, paralytic agents is now debatable. But again, I usually use it in pushes uh, pushes for the patient if not achieving adequate, you know, vent synchrony. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Shukran, shukran, Dr. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Hello?